Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, uh, Eric Novick, and today we're going to be discussing some things about ODEs in the Bayesian context, and we're lucky to have Charles Morgosian with us. Welcome to the program, Charles. Hi, Eric, and uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for having me here. Excellent. So let's get some background uh, on you. So uh, as an undergraduate, you studied physics at a small college in New England, Connecticut. Somehow you got interested in stats. So the, my first question for you is, what, what's wrong with physics? <laughs> no, nothing's wrong with, with physics. I was doing astronomy with the uh, Exoplanet Lab. So that was at Yale with Deborah Fisher. We had all this data that NASA had collected on uh, exoplanets. So they were looking for planets and other stellar systems. And there's a lot of data. Uh, and we're kind of, we're looking through this data. We're trying to see what kind of information we can get out. And of course, there's a lot of noise. And so really it's this data mining exercise. And I'm not gonna you know, discuss what my particular project was, but I remember thinking, you know, it's very hard to, to know whether we've proven a hypothesis or not. Right, that was kind of this this framework of, you know, we have a hypothesis, we're going to try and prove it. And how do we know that we actually have uh, information? How can we be skeptical about the conclusions that we reach without throwing away valuable information and kind of like finding that balance and really figuring out what is it that we've actually learned and, and starting to think a little bit about uncertainty. Uh, and it was it was an uphill battle. It was a frustrating experience. I don't think that my senior thesis was uh, very good, uh, but it confronted me with certain realities of data analysis. Uh, and in that sense, it was a very, very good project to have as an undergraduate. And I'm very grateful to, to the mentors I had. And then the plan was to take, take a year or two off to learn statistics, uh, to learn coding, become more proficient at that, so that when I returned to physics or astronomy, I would be more comfortable with analyzing data. That's not at all what happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so you got involved in, in pharmacometrics, right, at Metrum, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, which is about the time when I met you. I think we, we met like at one of the data science conferences or, or something like that. I guess you, you started doing some stats and you started working in pharmacometrics. So from, from, from your point of view, what are some of the differences and similarities from like physics to pharmacometrics to statistics? That's a deep question. So I'm going to try not to open Pandora's box, but I think that, you know, both all these fields are very heterogeneous, right? So you'll find a lot of overlap and a lot of distinct things. Uh, what I remember is when I was studying physics, and so most of what we do in, in, in classes is uh, theoretical physics, right? Let it be said. It's kind of, it's, you know, you, you start with a system and you try to find some simple model to describe it. And you keep going for a simpler representation, a simpler representation, and then, but it's always a more fundamental representation, right? It's this idea of uh, reductionism. And so really the goal is trying to find what are the most fundamental particles, the most fundamental building blocks, and what are their most fundamental interaction rules. I think that's kind of the idea behind the, you know, uh, this theory of everything, right? There's one equation that describes it all. Whereas in pharmacometrics and maybe more broadly in biology, I think we were more interested in emerging behaviors. So you have a system that has, uh, you know, simple components, simple interaction rules, and yet the resulting system can be very complicated. Right? And that was an exciting, different and complementary perspective. And you have stuff like that in physics, right? I think the easing model is a great example of something that's incredibly simple to write down. And yet has a very complicated behavior, but that was a bit more present in biology. I think it hits you harder. And so then, you know, it starts making sense thinking of, you know, probabilistic models, generative models and saying, well, you know, I know that the model is wrong, but it gives me more insight than if I were to actually, you know, describe all the fundamental interactions and, you know, how every fundamental particle behaves. I care about the emerging behavior. So that was very exciting. And then, of course, you know, then statistics comes into play. And then, you know, that's when I really started making some sense of statistical mechanics. And so that was a fun transition to go through and, and you know, to start thinking about, you know, useful 
insightful simplifications. So now you, you, you've also been a stand developer now for, for a few years, right? And, and so what kind of attracted you to stand and what kind of things have you been working on? in the stand project? When uh, Metrum, so I worked, as you mentioned, at a biotech company called Metrum Research Group. And so they do pharmacometrics. My mentor, Bill Gillespie, and a few other uh, folks were very interested in STEM and its potential, but it, there were still some components that were missing to make it very applicable to pharmacometrics. The project I was involved in was developing an extension of STAN for pharmacometrics applications. And that was called Torsten. But in the process, we also developed a lot of features for STAN, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to develop a matrix exponential to solve uh, linear ODEs, that doesn't need to just live in the uh, extension, that can live in the original language. Right? So the extension is more for specialized routines. And of course, I fell down the rabbit hole, and I really enjoyed the, my experience with uh, STAN, with Bayesian uh, statistics. This was a perspective on data analyses that I wish I had had as an undergrad. And it's funny, you go through the frustration and you start, you start, you know, coming up with some of these ideas, right? But to actually see it all in one framework, mm. that was a very powerful experience. So I got involved with Stan. I worked on ODE-based models as motivated by pharmacometrics. But then I, I went on to pursue a, my PhD in statistics at Columbia University. And I kept working and there were some interesting connections. So some of the things I did for pharmacometrics, which is working on these, these ODE-based models and more generally these likelihood-based on implicit functions, they turned out to be relevant to other schemes. So for example, embedded Laplace approximations, where within Hamilton and Monte Carlo, we're solving an optimization problem, and then we need to find clever ways of propagating derivatives through these implicit functions. So now a big part of my uh, PhD and my thesis has been combining sampling methods so Markov chains Monte Carlo with approximate methods. So for example, the Laplace approximation, which is really a vanilla variational inference, you know, and finding ways to couple them together. Right? And that's something that I'm working hard and then prototyping it in Stan. Now there's a difference between, you know, saying, hey, this is going to be a new feature in Stan uh, tomorrow, and uh, this is research that we're prototyping. And mm -hmm. within the Stan team, we're kind of doing both. I, but that's definitely one thing. Uh, yeah, so now I'm, I'm, I'm prototyping this method, although some features I, I'm hoping will, uh, will release sooner than later. And that's uh, certainly exciting as a researcher, but I think it'll also be exciting for practitioners. Excellent. Okay, so with that, let's take it to your talk. I'm going to hand it over to you. Feel free to share your screen. For our viewers and listeners, if you have questions for... Charles, I hope you do have some questions for him. Please type them into the stage chat. I will collect those questions and at the end of the talk, we will present those back back to Charles and hopefully have a have a discussion afterwards. So take it away. Thanks, Eric. Thanks to everyone who's here. Hello to, to those I know and uh, also looking forward to meeting everyone else. Uh, today's topic is going to be uh, outstanding challenges when solving ODEs in a Bayesian context. And I'm gonna try and focus on what it is about uh, the Bayesian context that makes solving of these uh, even harder than it might otherwise be. And maybe I should warn you that my intent here is more to raise questions or figure out what are the right questions to ask than to propose uh, solutions. Uh, I'm still unsure about a lot of these things. I wanna invite uh, people to join this conversation. Uh, we will present some answers along the way, but I think the, the exciting stuff is what we haven't solved yet. I'll acknowledge that for some of the work I'm presenting, I did it in collaboration with uh, my advisor, Andrew Gannon, and also Sebastian Weber, who is a uh, pharmacometrician, a contributor to STAN, and who has done a lot for STAN for ODE-based models. And then in general, you know, conversations with, the, with my colleagues on the STAN development team. So as you might suspect, uh, solving ODEs and more generally differential equations can be difficult, but in a Bayesian context, it's even harder because not only do I need to solve an ODE for a particular parameter value, I actually need to solve it for a lot of parameter values. Right? And this is true 
when you're using, for example, a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler, right? So your MCMC sampler is moving across the parameter space. If you're using something like variational inference or even any optimization, right? You have to move to the parameter space. In the modern age of gradient-based algorithms, I also need to worry about propagating derivatives through these ODE solutions. Really what that means is confronted with tuning problems, right? How do I tune my ODE solver when uh, I need to solve the ODE for many different parameter values, which can change the behavior of the ODE. And then when, once we start propagating uh, derivatives, there are more tuning parameters we need to worry, and there are also some computational pitfalls. The subject of propagating derivatives through ODE solutions is not one that I will discuss during today's talk. Uh, I think it's a fascinating branch of automatic differentiation, one that has received a lot of attention in the machine learning and statistics community recently. So there's a lot of exciting work going there. For now, what I'll do is I'll point you to a recent preprint that came out. So this is Stan Centric, and this was uh, written with uh, three wonderful colleagues. And it's about fitting disease transmission models. And in particular, we look at the COVID-19 example. And the fun anecdote that I like to bring up is some of our colleagues in epidemiology had this model they wanted to fit, and it took three days to run the model. And then with some fellow stand developers, including Ben Bales, big shout out to him, you know, just by reasoning about how Stan operates computationally and how our derivatives handle and how they're propagating, we were able to rewrite the exact same model, but get it to run in two hours. And so this is described uh, in this preprint. I'll also mention, if you're familiar with adjoint methods for differential equations, this is something we're pushing hard in Stan, and that's an effort that's, that's spearheaded by uh, Sebastian and Ben with, uh, with other people involved. What this talk is going to focus on is, uh, first of all, I'll briefly describe what I mean by an ODE-based model, and I'll look at two case studies, which are very simple, but I think they have some depth to them. And one is going to be this planetary motion example, which was meant to be a simple textbook example, but soon became a complicated textbook example. Uh, and here the focus is going to be a little bit on Bayesian workflows. And so what I mean by that is I'm not just going to show you a model that's polished and works nicely. I'm going to show you a model that uh, actually we had a hard time to fit. How can we reason about the problems that we're encountering? And how can we fix that? The second example will be for kinetics and you know, some ideas for ODEs. Uh, so in both cases, it's simulated data. Uh, here, I'm more interested in uh, you know, methodology, but it resonates with some experience we've had working with real data. In a Bayesian context, we're going to distinguish between observed variables and unobserved variables. And uh, if I want to specify a Bayesian model, really all I need to do is specify a joint distribution over my observed and unobserved variable. One of the tricks we're using here is unknown, unknown variables, including uh, model parameters, we're treating them as random variables, right? This is a, a mathematical step and it can have multiple interpretations. The joint distribution can be factored into a likelihood and a prior. It doesn't have to. Oftentimes it's convenient to do that. When I say an ODE-based model, all I mean is that to compute this distribution. So let's say to compute this density, let's assume that you know, this distribution has a density. To compute this density, I need to solve an ODE. And we're going to be more interested in the case where we cannot solve the ODE analytically and we need a numerical solver. Let's now talk about this planetary motion example. So this is actually from a uh, large paper called Bayesian Workflow that came out recently and which I encourage you to read it and I encourage you to give us feedback on it. And the idea is we're going to have a planet in orbit around the star. We're going to record the uh, movement of the planet and then we're going to try and infer some of the physical properties of the star planet system. To simplify it a little bit, let's say I have a parameter k and k is the star planet interaction. And so maybe I'll be the, the the strength of the gravitational interaction. I'm going to have the true position of the planet Q. And actually to do that, I'm going to have to solve a system of differential equations that's prescribed by Newton's law of motion. But my observation is going to be some perturbation of uh, that position, right? And the perturbation is going to be described by a normal distribution. This defines my likelihood. 
and then I'll put a prior on the parameters of interest. Some other variables that I am going to care about, one is going to be the planet's real position. I'll also care about the planet's momentum, and I'll care about the star's position. And note here is that the star's position doesn't depend on T, because I'm modeling the star as though it was not moving. Now, in practice, it does move a little bit, but here we're simply going to assume that it's not moving. So if I take Newton's laws of motions, which is a second-order differential equation, I can rewrite it as a system of first-order differential equations. This is a fairly simple system, right? Uh, it's worth noting that. And, and yet, once we start examining this in a Bayesian context without the right proportions, which we're semi-deliberately not going to take, we'll see that we can run into issues. But for now, trust that you can solve this with a numerical solver. And then the parameters that I want to infer to characterize the star planet system are going to be k. So again, the gravitational interaction, q0, the initial position of the planet, p0, the initial position of the planet, and then q star, the position of the star. And again, because I'm in a Bayesian context, not only do I need to solve this ODE, I need to solve it for the many values of k I'm going to encounter, right? k and more generally theta. And I also need to propagate derivatives through Q. Right? So augmented problem. The first thing that uh, I realized is uh, if I try to fit the model with all the thetas, so I'm using Stan here in Hamilton and Monte Carlo, Stan goes insane. And this is an invitation to take a step back and say, okay, look, we're, we're going to simplify the model. We're going to try and fit a simpler model. And once we have a working base model, we're going to build our way back to the complicated model. So let's try fitting only with K. That's as simple as you can make it still doesn't work. The chains do not mix, and it's time to look for clues to try and understand why am I not getting any stable inference. And actually, the first thing that jumps to your mind if you try to run this example is how vastly, vastly different the runtimes are between chains. And if you've played with Stan and you've tried fitting ODE-based models, or even complicated models, uh, maybe you've seen something like that. But I want to I want to draw your attention to chain number two, which takes less than four seconds to run, and chain number three, which which takes more than an hour to run. Right? So clearly the chains are behaving differently, and then we can confirm that by examining the trace plots, where where you see that the chains are not at all converging to the same region. Right here, it looks like the chains are, are not moving. They're actually oscillating. But the within-chain variability is so small compared to the between-chain variability that you know, it looks like the chains are not moving. So OK, this is an interesting plot. Now I'm going to add the warm-up phase. And one thing that's going to, to, to become immediately obvious is that the starting point, the starting point, uh, really determines where my chains land, right? And this suggests that, you know, you have some multimodal distribution. Once a chain lands inside the mode, it's not able to escape that mode. Uh, so that's always a good thing to know. And at this point, you know, you, you could look at this plot kind of reason, okay, my chains, which are, which are well behaving, so they return a high log join distribution, right? They all converge around k equals one. And these are actually also the chains that run super quickly. On the other hand, so chain number three, which takes more than an hour to run, goes for a large value of k and also has a very low log posterity. Maybe you can already guess why that chain is so much slower than the other chains. But just to confirm that indeed, you know, these chains are misbehaving, I'm going to do a posterior predictive check. And here kind of the plot twist is I'm doing it, I'm separating per chain, right? I'm looking at the implication of every chain. And here again, so chain two, my well-behaving uh, chain, no problem, fits the data. Uh, chain number three doesn't fit the data at all. And one thing that's not super clear in this picture is that actually, according to the parameters that chain number three is sampling, the planet is actually undergoing a lot of orbits. Bad mark of chain, slow mark of chain, that's often the case. That's often the case. And here, what's actually happening is that when K is large, that means the gravitational interaction is stronger. The planet is orbiting 
around the star at a much faster rate, and it's traveling a much larger distance. So if you think about what a numerical integrator has to do, when, you know, K is so large, it has to take more steps to accurately solve the OD. So much more steps that uh, sampling for large values of K is, is two orders of magnitude, uh, three orders of magnitude, takes three orders of magnitude longer than sampling for simple chains, right? So we had a very simple differential equations, and this is a nice, easy example where, well, check this out, you know, as the parameter value changes, the behavior of the ODE can really change. And that, that has a huge impact, right? If, if it completely changes my computation. So that's upsetting. And then the other question is, well, why, where are these modes coming from? Where are these modes coming from? And I just want to make clear that this is a very simple star planet system. There's no chaotic behavior. There's nothing fancy happening, right? But there's something tricky happening. And it hits us hard because we are in a Bayesian context. And so with that, so before I tell you, you know, exactly what's going on, just based on the clues that we've collected, and which I would argue is, you know, the basic diagnostics that you might run, what would be some ideas for, you know, fixing the inference? Let's take a minute to think about it. And I invite people in the audience to type in the chat box some ideas, some suggestions that they might have. Okay, so, uh, so let me read out some of the comments that, that are made because I think they're all spot on. Yeah, so the most, so the most popular uh, suggestion is using stronger priors. So, okay, that's, a, that's an idea. Let's keep that in mind. Someone else suggests killing the chains with a longer runtime. That's a bit radical, but... It's worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about. So again, tighter priors, and then somebody look for funnels in the model, reparameterization. Uh, okay, so we have a lot of ideas. I saw someone uh, suggesting having a fixed time, time step size for the solver instead of going for accuracy. That's true. So, so then this gets a bit tricky. So I love this point. I think it's an excellent point because you know for certain chains, when the value of k is large, then maybe we want other tuning parameters so that we're not waiting uh, so long. But then for small values of k, maybe you know we are happy with this time, time step that, that's being taken. Uh, so these are all good suggestions. And so what I'm going to argue is before the ODE could have more than one solution, the chains are converging to different solutions. So that's the, the idea that there is some kind of degeneracy. And I think that that's an excellent point. And these are these are all questions that I thought about. So one thing I also thought about is maybe my OD integrator is not accurate. Uh, maybe instead of, so Stan gives you multiple OD integrators, maybe I, used to, I need to use another one. Maybe I need to use uh, one with, with a, you know, more strict tolerances. And the other thing that crossed my mind is that this is actually a Hamiltonian system, right? Which is what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uses. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo as its OD integrator actually uses a symplectic integrator. Right, because you know classic numerical integrators misbehave. So so maybe I, I thought this could be. And the thing is, we can definitely try all these things, but but we need to look for a bit more clues before making a decision. Right. So now what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to show you a more in-depth analysis of what the problem is, and as I'm doing that. Think about all these solutions that you've proposed and think about whether they, they, they would be appropriate or not and what the trade-offs might be. To do my more in-depth analysis, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to plot the whole log likelihood. But so I can do that because k is now one-dimensional. k is one-dimensional, and so that means that I can just compute the log likelihood or even the log joint distribution. And what I see here is that indeed I have a multimodal distribution, but this mode is much higher than the other modes. Right? And in fact, all of the probability mass concentrates in this mode, and these are just minor modes that don't really contribute any probability mass, but they're able to tra trap Markov chains. They're able to track Markov chains. 
And so what that means is if I'm interested in uh, sampling, if I'm interested in doing Monte Carlo estimates of expectation value, the chains that run in these modes are wasted. Any chain that's running in these modes is wasted computational resources. So I kind of want all my chains to focus on that. And so that already tells me what solution I should do. Now, you'll say, we are cheating here. Usually, we cannot make a plot like that. You know, we're in this one-dimensional case. Yes, we're cheating, but we earned our cheating. And we earned our cheating because we took a model that had seven parameters, and we turned it into a model that had one parameter. And granted, you can't always do that, but you can always try and compute conditional uh, likelihoods, where you'll fix some of the parameters and then let one vary. And in fact, in the, uh, in the paper, in the case study, this is something we do a bit later. So I think this is an interesting idea, uh, maybe worth pursuing more. The next question is, why do I have these wiggles, these small modes, and why do I have such a deep dive here? And that's where, you know, I was trying to use all the diagnostics in the toolkit. There's nothing that immediately gives you an answer. You just need to take a closer look. And you just need to think hard about the problem. And so what I did here, it's kind of like a posterior predictive check. Uh, but I simply simulated orbits for varying values of k. And the correct value of k is 1. So that's where my observation would appear. Actually, the noise is, is very small. Remember that we have a normal error. So then what's going to inform the density is going to be, the log density is going to be the square distance between my observation and between the position simulated for a value of k. Right? That's what matters. And so first observation, if k is less than 1, then the planet can drift arbitrarily away from the observations. Right? So as k goes to 0, the planet drifts very far away, and so the, leg, the log density just goes down. On the other hand, if k is greater than 1, well, the planet is restricted to be within those circles. Right? So that puts a limit on how far away we can be from the observations, and that's why we kind of have this flat curve. And now the interesting thing is that because of the cyclical nature of the data, just by chance, just by chance, another, you know, one of your simulation is going to happen to be closer to the true observation, right? So for example, here I have k equals 1.16, 1.6. So I do the simulation for a certain observation. So it appears all the way over there. And then I do the same for 2.16. And it appears here. And that's actually closer by chance to the observation. And that's why you get this wiggle behavior. So my algorithm is sensible to these wiggle behavior. And now if I go back to this, so I want to emphasize, look at how, how much smaller this mode is than this one, right? Look at the, the numbers here. And so a prior, a stronger prior, actually, we already had a strong prior on care. A stronger prior alone is not going to fix this. Because if I take the product of the prior and the likelihood, I'm always going to have these wiggles. So then what you can do is you can do a truncated prior, right, where you completely exclude these, uh, these solutions. Or you re-parameterize uh, the model, but you really need to truncate if you want to do this with a prior. Uh, so here are some candidate solutions that we thought, we thought about. So one thing I realized, so I use stands default initial values, and actually they're not really appropriate. They're not, in the sense that they're not consistent with my prior. So I would argue, maybe we should carefully choose initial points. And actually I've gotten quite a bit of resistance from that because I think a lot of people don't want to worry about initial points, right? There's this conventional wisdom is that the algorithm forgets where it started. And you know, that's why we started at different points, because we want to make sure that it forgets where it started. But the unfortunate reality is that uh, for many models, uh, the initial points are not forgotten. And this is one tuning parameter like another, and we need to worry about. Another idea was to use stacking to weight. So that's a, you know, an important sampling scheme where you're going to try and weight the different chains. Uh, and effectively, 
Well, what that ends up doing in this situation is throwing away the chains that are at regions with low density. Effectively, it does the same thing. And my problem with stacking is that, so remember that I fitted a simplified model. This is not the model I actually care about. Now I'm going to fit the more complicated model. If I use stacking, you know, I'm still going to have some chains that are going to take hours to run, and that then I'm going to completely ignore. That's a, that's a big con for me. Whereas if I carefully choose the initial points, you know, and, I'm, and I have an understanding that these local modes are unimportant, that's important. You know? I'm not just throwing, in, uh, throwing out the chains. I'm kind of like understanding why my computational resource, my precious computational resources are wasted. Then the initial points is a more practical way of moving forward. And then there's building in constraints and truncated priors. So not just stronger priors, you really need truncated priors to deal with this problem. So that's a nice textbook example. It was supposed to be more simpler, but you know the complication makes it all that more pedagogical. And the cool thing is that this issue we were able to diagnose with the one-dimensional parameter. It keeps coming up as you make the model more complicated. And so therefore, kind of the insight that we're able to get here, we're able to apply it to more complicated models because what's really going to be uh, uh, difficult is the cyclical nature of the data. Now, the other thing that I want to think about is how can we fail faster, right? When I'm developing models, I don't want to wait hours for rogue chains or misbehaving chains, and they arise all the time in OD-based models. I don't want to wait hours for them to run. And I think we need to change a little bit our perspective, which is one, we run less iterations before checking, uh, but then we'll also get in the, the habit of we run some iterations, we check the result, uh, but then we don't start from scratch again and we keep running iterations. You know, that sounds a little bit obvious when you say that, but as far as I can tell, Stan and other softwares don't make it very easy to do that, even though it's possible and I can share some R code on how to do that. The other thing that I'd like to do is examine the chains that run quickly and then, you know, not wait for the chains that run slowly. Right? So we just need to be a bit more aware that, you know, things are going to behave heterogeneously and, you know, I don't need to wait hours to realize that there is a problem and I want to move a bit faster through that. And again, you can code that even if that's not super straightforward. With that, I'm going to move to Case number two, pharmacokinetics. So I realize people are asking questions. I'll save the questions for the end. I'll go through, we'll go through them at the end. And so here, I'm, I'm going to look at a simple example. Uh, so usually we're interested in more complicated example, but this kind of illustrates our points well. This gives the story. So we have a nonlinear model that's actually pretty simple. And what this is describing is how a drug compound is absorbed and then how it is cleared outside the body. And this is going to be described by a system of differential equations. So now let's say we want to fit this model. And let's say we're in the context of Stan. The question we'll usually ask ourselves is which ODE integrator should we use? So again, a bit Stan centric here, but the concepts uh, generalize beyond Stan. We have the options between various solvers. So Ranga Kata and backward differentiation. There's also an Adams Moulton in there, although I haven't quite figured out where exactly it fits on the algorithmic landscape. But usually we use Ranga Kata for something called non-stiff differential equations, where the rates at which the solution is changing is pretty stable over time. And then we have the backward differentiation the BDF solver, which is, this, which is designed to tackle stiff equations. And uh, usually the rule of thumb is that RK45 is faster, but maybe a bit less stable. BDF is more conservative, but it's slower. It can be much slower too. But then I also need to worry about a lot of other tuning parameters. So the tolerance. So when do I think that the accuracy of a solution is good enough? Right? And that can change the speed at which your algorithm is running, right? Maximum number of steps. And Stan only gives you a fraction of the tuning parameters that actually exist for differential 
the equations. So there's more to worry about. I'm going to argue that the question is actually even more complicated than this. Because I ask which OD integrator should we use? But what is actually the right question here? What question should I be asking? All right, well, we'll, 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 we'll keep that in mind. Uh, so keep thinking about that and we'll get to that. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try my RK45 solver and my BDS solver with the default tuning uh, parameters. One thing that uh, is interesting, so again, here I'm only reporting the run times. Now I realize that the run times are not a perfect estimate of performance, but I think they do give us some insight. What's one thing that's striking about this is that A, the runtime changes again a lot between different chains. And I should point out that this time the chains are mixing. So they're actually all you know, converging to the same area and getting you know, samples from the same distribution. Nevertheless, the runtime changes a lot between chains. And also the warm-up takes much more time for RK45 than the sampling. Why is that? Think about it, we'll get to that. By contrast, if I look at the BDF solver, here has something that's much more stable. There isn't a lot of change between the different chains. And also there isn't a lot of difference between sampling and warm-up, right? So that's an indication that something is more, more stable here. Even though on average, the BDF solver is slower than the RK45 solver. And so to reason a little bit about what might be going on, we can think a little bit about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is the algorithm I'm running here, and what it does during the different phases. So first I have the warm-up phase where I'm going to start at some initial point. And that point can be good. It can also not be good at all. But then the chain is exploring the parameter space and it's moving in various areas. And some of these areas may not quite be relevant some of these areas may be patently absurd. And so this is kind of the danger zone. This is where the, you know, we may get into parameter values that really make the ODE hard to solve and unstable. And then the Markov chain has to adapt its tuning parameters. So in the case of HMC mass matrix and step size, so that once it finds the region we're interested in and that we want to sample from, and which I will argue on average is better behaved, it needs to adapt these tuning parameters so that it stays in that well-behaved region. So you can see how during the warm-up phase, uh, we're much more vulnerable to poorly behaving ODs. And I think that's why RK45 displays so much instability, because you can get unlucky, and when you get unlucky, that really slows down your numerical solve. On the other hand, once I'm during the sampling phase, you know, I'm in a fairly well-behaving region, so I might expect that the, uh, that the miracle solver are going to do better. Right? And that, to me, explains a little bit the discrepancy in runtimes that we have seen. I think that for certain parameter values, the OD becomes stiff, and so the non-stiff solver can no longer handle them. But usually, once we're in the sampling phase, uh, things behave better. So then, that prescribes. So then, you know, going back to to my previous question, you know, rather than saying which OD integrator should we use, maybe it's which OD integrators with an S should we use. So we should uh, consider uh, multiple OD integrator, or you know, uh, more adaptive OD integrators. That can, that can kind of like self-tune a little bit better. And so, you know, there's this uh, epic quest for universal ODE integrators that are just going to work with every problem you throw at it. And, uh, you know, maybe that's particularly uh, useful for a Bayesian context. But in any case, so now if I look at a little bit at the tools that I have at my disposal, these observations suggest the following scheme which is to say I'm going to use BDF during the warm-up phase, and then I'm going to use RK45 during the sampling phase. I could also uh, say I'm going to use BDF only for some of the warming phase because MC the uh, MCMC finds the region with high probability mass, so uh, sometimes referred to as the typical set, but 
but now that's a, a controversial term, but you know, it's still a, a good way to think about it. And then once I am in this region, even though I'm still warming up, I switch to RK45. So I'm going to call these methods the warm start because here I'm starting to use the RK45 with a warm start and the cool start because here I'm starting to use uh, RK45 with a cool start. Name subject to change, suggestions welcomed. And so now I can compare uh, a little bit how uh, my model fitting does. And what I'm going to use is the relaxation time, which is the time to produce one independent sample. I'll look at one parameter. There's one to one map between this and the uh, effective sample size per second, which is also a performance metric that's often used. And so here, of course, what I want is I want my relaxation time to be as small as possible. So I now run H, I run my H chains in parallel with every method. And then I, I, I estimate the relaxation time for every chain, and this is what I get. And so let's, let's start by examining the, the, the bottom. So this is RK45. And what you see is widely varying relaxation time, right? That's consistent with the widely varying run times. And so in the gray bar, I've, I've, uh, I've, I'm showing the average relaxation time, probably not the relevant metric. Right, because we're always running multiple chains in parallel. I guess we don't have to, but oftentimes we're waiting for the last chain to run. So that means that what matters is the weakest link. So maybe we need to, you know, maybe this is really the, the, the point that matters. Maybe we need to, to update our strategy a little bit. Because again, if I'm in a right, model exploration, model development phase, maybe I don't have to wait for the weakest link. And then the average behavior becomes a more interesting metric, right? So this goes back to the, the planet case study where, you know, I don't want to wait three hours to realize there was a problem with my model. So by contrast, BDF solver is on average slower, but you get this very consistent behavior. And so the hope is that if we combine the two, we can get some of the more consistent behavior. And especially these guys, they're really slowed down by their warm-up phase. Right, so we can get the better warm-up phase, but then take advantage of the faster behavior of RK45. And so you kind of get that, even though there's still some instability. So there's one misbehaving chain, but you know, if I guess if you ignore that misbehaving chain, which, which really you should not do, but you would notice that this is doing, this is more stable than RK45, and this is faster than BDF. Right? And in fact, the cool start uh, not only is it the metric that does best if I look at the average behavior, it's also the metric that does best if I look at the weakest link. So this clearly illustrates a the ODE is behaving differently during different phases of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling on average. This could be something we take advantage of, although exactly how we're going to do this, how we decide you know, which method we're going to use, that's still something we need to think harder about. So I'll finish with uh, some remarks. We want to think about ODEs across the parameter space to recognize the heterogeneous behavior of the ODE. Right? You know, that's an invitation to be more careful when we use phrases such as an ODE is stiff right, or non-stiff because it can be stiff or non-stiff or an ODE is easy. So again, right, plan planetary motion. Very simple ODE, very easy to solve in some contexts, much harder to solve in other contexts. We want to worry about the weakest link when we are fitting our polished model, and we know that this is the model we're going to use to inform our inference and our decision. But while we're still in the model exploration phase, maybe we don't want to wait. So in these simple example hours, but in more complicated uh, examples, days, in order to investigate what our model is doing. And now, we have to think about what is a workflow to tune our algorithms, in particular to tune our OD integrator. And I think that if we really want optimal performance, you know, you know, we're confronted with this harder tuning problem, which is not only do we need to tune an integrator, we might have to tune multiple integrators. And so whether it's worth the hassle to worry about this to get additional performance, that's something uh, we need to learn more about. So again, Going back to my introduction, I give you a warning, which is I think we're going to raise more questions than provide 
answers here. This ends my talk, and now I'm happy to take questions and, and to get feedback and hear ideas from members. Of the Thank you, Charles. That was great. Let me, we, 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 we don't have a ton of time, but we, we do have a, a few minutes to do questions. And uh, let me start by asking, I think you, you alluded to this already, but what kind of things do you think can be added to stand that would make this problem easier to either diagnose or to deal with it? Do you think there are any tools that can be sort of added on to help us wrestle with? I think we just need to be a bit more comfortable with uh, not running chains for a fixed number of iterations. You know, kind of like uh, maybe running it for a fixed number of time and then, you know, inspecting what is going on and what we already have. You know, and, and having a, a bit more of a step-by-step. -step. The interface with Stan is a bit rigid right now, even though there, there are workarounds. And maybe, you know, maybe we, we do have the workarounds to, to deal with that. And it's just a matter of writing a case study. But, you know, kind of changing the perspective. I'm not going to wait for the worst case scenario. So I think that that's a big step forward. Then, so there are more adaptive OD integrators than what's provided by Stan, right? Uh, so, for example, El Soda's integrator tries to understand whether the problem is stiff or non-stiff and then it you know changes the adaptation so maybe yeah. it is worth expanding you know the, the our toolkit of ODE integrators and you know trying to find more universal ODE integrators yeah but then the, the point is that the, sorry Bill chimed in with that idea as well so he uh, Bill, Bill Gillespie mentioned how about adaptive solvers like El Soto yeah, yeah, so exactly. So Elsa is an option. I think there are some license issues about implementing it in Stan, but I really hope that if Elsoda is a viable solution, that's not going to stop us from doing it. But so that's good news for uh, the community at large, right? Stan is not the only tool out there. Right. But then, of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, sometimes a problem with the ODE is a problem with the model. It's a problem with our priors, with our initial points, with our, right? So it's not just... Sometimes we don't have to solve the hard problem. So Andrew calls that the fault theorem of statistics, of statistical yes, yes. computation. Yeah, I think Computa that's... Yeah. yeah, computational problems are often... Are I see there, there are a lot problems. of great... That's fine. I'll pick out some questions for you. So Chris is asking, is there a convergence diagnostic that could be used for adaptive halting of chains instead? Yes. Uh, so I'll refer to uh, so Yi Zhang and Bill, who are in the audience. So they actually had a, um, a poster on the subject at the American Conference on Pharmacometrics 2020. And they're pursuing ideas in that direction, also in the context of pharmacometrics. So I would, I would point you to that direction, and I'll let Bill and Yi post a link to that poster, uh, which is very exciting work. Adrian is asking, what range of tolerances does seem more or less reasonable? Uh, I don't know, is that a specific enough question to? Yeah, it depends, uh, it depends. So there's this cool idea that I know uh, Ben Bales has been pursuing. And honestly, usually I like to start with a tolerance that's really not that strict, especially when I'm developing the model. And then trying to see whether that works out. So I like to start with tunings that are less strict than what the defaults are. So that mm -hmm. because what I'm what I'm interested in when I'm developing a model is I want to I want to catch its modes of failures. I want to catch obvious failures. That's the first thing I care about. I'm not interested in you know fitting the model perfectly because that's not the model that I'm going to use in the end. I'm still developing the model, right? And so in those contexts. Uh, if I use tolerances that aren't too strict, um, then that's fine. Then once I start realizing that, hey, you know, these tolerances are, uh, you know, uh, they seem to be problematic. And they, there are multiple ways of, of doing that. But sometimes, you know, the diagnostics point that out. Another way of doing that is you compute the log posterior uh, density for various tuning parameters, and you see whether that makes an important difference or not. Right? And if it does, then you know that for the problem you're interested in, you're not hitting the accuracy you probably need. Mm. Right? Uh, and so I think that that's a good approach. And so now, okay, the direction that, so then this becomes an important sampling problem, right? 
Because if I'm using a, a tolerance that's not very strict, then really what I'm doing is, you can think of it as I'm computing an approximation of the log density. Right? And then I can ask, well, is that approximation good enough? And so I can deploy the tools that exist for, approxim for, for density approximation in that context. And so one example would be important sampling or providers to important sampling. But those are some of the ideas that are flying around, and which I think are very exciting. There's another question and comment from Bill. Could some of the problems be induced by the need to solve the augmented ODE system in STAN in order to calculate gradients? Yes, absolutely. So I can't go into too much detail. So there's, so there's some nice, sorry, there's no short answer. Sometimes we don't have to worry about, sometimes we should worry about, and it also depends on what kind of augmented system we use. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and that's going to go back to this idea of, am I doing a forward solve, which is what Stan currently does, or am I doing a backward solve? And there are other methods. So right now, Stan, you only do a forward solve. We're going to have a joint methods come in. But for example, so I know that, uh, so for example, Julia, right? So I know that they have an array of methods to propagate derivatives. And depending on what method you choose, you will get different behaviors. Uh, and I think JAX also has uh, multiple options. So the augmented system is going to be different. There's also a question, could tempering during tuning help? Uh, in other words, start by sampling from the prior, but move to the posterior step by step. I mean, yeah, so this kind of goes back to when you have a uh, multimodality and uh, maybe it helps, but not always. And that can be difficult to implement and difficult to tune. So I think that tempering is, is, is good when you have multiple modes that you care about and you want to jump between these modes. When you have pesky modes, that are just ma mathematical artifacts. Using something like tempering uh, can be a bit overkill. And the reason is, so let's go back to the planet example. Even if I'm using uh, tempering, right, I'm still going to waste a lot of computational resources. Actually, no. Well, hmm, how does that work out? So I start in the wrong mode, then I temper, but then when I cool down, there's a good chance I'm not going to go to the to the minor mode. Yeah. So that that could be an interesting option. Actually. Yeah. All right, I think this is uh, all the time we have. I'd like to thank you, Charles, again for, for coming. This was a, a great discussion. Do you want to let people, how they can maybe get in touch with you if they have additional questions? Yeah, uh, how do they so find you? should I type in my uh, email sure. address? If you're if you're brave, yeah. So I got to close it out for now. Thanks again. Thanks, Charles, for coming. Thank you, everybody. I'd love to have you here. We're uh, going to be back I, on, in March. Uh, sure, thank you, Eric, for having me, and uh, uh, thanks, thanks everyone for joining the conversation.